Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is um, Dr. Anwar uh, Buhars, and I am a professor of um, counterterrorism, counter and violent extremism here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C. But I want to extend a very uh, warm welcome to the many Africa Center alumni, our distinguished colleagues and friends who have joined us today for this webinar on gender dimensions of power and violent extremism um, in Africa. Now I'd like to pass it over to our director, Kate Alquist, Bob, to say a few words about the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. Kate. Thank you, Anwar, and uh, good day uh, to uh, all of our uh, colleagues uh, joining us. So uh, welcome uh, to the Africa Center's alumni, uh, distinguished colleagues uh, and friends. Uh, we're really delighted to have you with us for this program today. The Africa Center for Strategic Studies serves as a forum for research, for academic programs, and for the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. And we carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. And recognizing that addressing serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. And by engaging together, you know, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, national, regional, international, you know, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today. Uh, and that uh, we can all uh, work towards more endurable, enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue uh, we hope uh, infused with real world experience such as we're gonna hear from our panelists today uh, and fresh analysis uh, uh, provides an opportunity for continued learning and uh, catalyzes concrete actions. And so we look forward to the discussion uh, shortly uh, on uh, gender dimensions of countering violent extremism. Uh, please allow me to extend my uh, gratitude in advance uh, to our panelists uh, for being with us today. Uh, and thank you uh, to all of you for you know, being part of this conversation with us. We look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Anwar. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. Uh, and now let's begin our session on gender dimensions of power and violent extremism in, in Africa. We have two distinguished panelists with us uh, today that will help us, you know, unpack the value of gender as a cross-cutting issue and lens in power and violent extremism. So this webinar, provides an opportunity to fill in <clears throat> the knowledge gaps in, in current counter and violent extremism strategies by you know, highlighting how gender sensitive considerations and analysis in a given context, obviously, allows for a better understanding of the gender differences in the drivers of violent extremism, as well as the gender impact <clears throat> of counter and violent extremism. So in recent years, there has been a, you know, a growing recognition that gender matters in the fight against violent extremism uh, <clears throat> and terrorism. I mean, the fact that violent extremist groups themselves, they exploit gender dynamics and that government security measures necessarily affect you know, women and men, obviously, have made it patently clear that any CVE strategy, policy, or program must be informed by gender sensitive analysis, as well as the meaningful um, engagement of women at all levels and in all functions, uh, including among law enforcement agencies, of course. So the presence of women among, you know, among the police, um, and other security and government agencies allows a better understanding of the gender dimensions, as well as the implications <clears throat> of countering violent extremism. 
Yet, despite this growing gender awareness, um, the inclusion and mainstreaming of gender analysis and perspectives across uh, CVE activities in Africa still lag behind. I mean, on the ground, you know, CVE efforts are still uh, clouded by crude gender assumptions and stereotypes. In some violent um, extremism affected contexts, the involvement of women um, has largely centered on their roles as counterweights against violent extremism and terrorism. Yet, as we will hear today, um, women are not just passive actors to be leveraged in attempts to dissuade you know, their sons from joining violent extremist organizations. They can also be active agents who participate in <clears throat> and who provide material support to violent extremists. Or they may speak out and join security forces in fighting against them. So this misconception tends to lead to the instrumentalization of women as tools to tackle radicalization, which is often considered to be a male issue. So this failure to perform a gender analysis of the motivations that drive men and women to join violent extremist groups, as well as the differentiated roles that they play in violent extremism, often <clears throat> tend to produce standardized responses that lack nuanced and context-specific understanding of the gender dimensions of CVE <clears throat> in Africa. And one consequence of this failure can be seen in how women tend to be rarely included in demobilization and reintegration programs. Um, you know, Somalia, for example, <clears throat> offers little support to women who left Shabab. Same applies to Nigeria, where women, where um, many women and girls, including those who had a stint in the poorly resourced uh, rehabilitation programs, ended up rejoining Boko Haram as a result of harsh socioeconomic deprivation, as a result of mistreatment by residents of their hometowns. So, our two panelists today will help us fill the gaps you know, in, in, um, um, in, in government responses by providing a better understanding um, of the role of gender in violent extremism <coughs> and countering violent, ex and, and counter violent extremism. <coughs> and, uh, and, and we're really privileged here um, to have, um, uh, as I said, two distinguished panelists, uh, Azadi uh, Movini, um, she's an author, a researcher, um, distinguished academic who has been writing about gender and politics in the Middle East uh, and also Africa for, for the last two decades. Uh, she started reporting in Cairo in 1999 <clears throat> while on the Fulbright Fellowship and has worked across the region for, for years. And her work um, has focused throughout on how women and girls are impacted by uh, political instability and conflict, as well as that interplay between you know, violent extremism, Islamism, and women's social and political rights. Uh, she's widely published, <clears throat> and her latest fascinating book uh, that I really recommend to, to all uh, to read, uh, Guest House for Young Widows uh, Among the Women of, of ISIS. Again, very outstanding book, was shortlisted for the Bailey uh, Gifford Prize and the uh, Folio Bradbourne Prize. Um, and finally, uh, uh, Azadeh directs the Gender and Conflict Project at the International Crisis Group, where her latest work has focused on women's recruitment to and disengagement from Shabab and Boko Haram, <clears throat> as well as the challenges of demobilizing women uh, affiliated with the Islamic State. And then we have uh, Ms. Janine Ella Avaton with us. She, uh, uh, she's at the Institute for Security Studies, also known as ISS or ISS Africa. She joined the Institute in 2015. She's currently a senior researcher in the ISS Dakar office, where she coordinates a project on gender, 
and violent extremism in Mali uh, and Niger. Uh, and she has done, again, fascinating uh, work on the ground. Uh, and her work covers peace and security issues in the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin, <coughs> sorry, and West Africa, coastal states. Uh, and before joining the ISS, she worked at the University of Pretoria in South Africa as an assistant lecturer in the Department of Political Science. Uh, Ella has a master's degree in security studies from the University of Pretoria. She is also a Mandela Washington uh, Fellow. Uh, and again, she is uh, uh, widely, uh, uh, widely published. So, so I'll start with, uh, uh, with Azadi. Um, Azadi, why is it important to study women's role in violent extremism? Uh, thank you, Anwar, for such a wonderful introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. So thank you for including me. I, I see some um, old colleagues and acquaintances in the chat. So greetings to everyone. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, good, good morning, depending on your time zone. Um, uh, I'm going to try and keep my, my answers short. I'm very excited to be here alongside Ella. I think we're going to have um, a really uh, excellent conversation, uh, and I look forward to your questions as well. Um, so I'll try to try to be brief so we have time for a good back and forth. Um, so Anwar, your first question, you know, why is it important to study women's involvement in, in militant groups and insurgent groups? Um, you know, I think those of us who've worked on these issues for a long time have, have understood uh, that it's really crucial to, to be able to see and map what these kind of groups offer women. Um, I think when you look from afar, they look extremely brutal, their, their social mores are highly patriarchal, they're fundamentalist, they're violent. Uh, what on earth do women get out of interacting with them? Um, you know, I think the incredible draw uh, that ISIS had for women sort of brought it to international attention that these groups do offer women something. Um, and so understanding that is really important to, I guess, primarily develop better policy to SAP support for them. Um, so I think looking at and researching why women's motivations are different than men's, you know, what, what is it in the political, economic, social context? Uh, and, and very often, you know, in crisis group, we're kind of very, we very much understand violent extremism is coming out of, you know, not simply a set of, of factors that you can see in lots of different environments, bad governance, poverty, but a confluence uh, of things. So what is it about a particular uh, political moment um, that, that brings women as well as men um, into the attention of these groups? So basically, what are the, the drivers or the push factors or whatever kind of vocabulary you like to bring to this kind of analysis that, um, that are specific to women? We have to understand that. Um, I think also, you know, women, families, are a social base, of course, for these insurgencies. Um, I think if we're only looking at the rhetoric of men, the recruitment of men, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And underneath is a whole social community fabric that sustains these groups. Uh, the communities, the living rooms, the all sorts of, you know, the, the whole the social base really, and women uh, are crucial to that. So um, even if they're not, in, immediately visible to what the group is saying and doing at the decision-making level, at the level of their digital platforms, they are the social glue and the, the sort of bulwark to it. Um, I think often as well, when we're dealing with, and I think you're gonna ask me, uh, Anwar, um, a lot today about al-Shabaab, you know, the resilience of these groups. I mean, of course, you know, we'll talk a lot and, you know, all of you, uh, are expert in dealing with um, the challenges of a kind of military strategy to putting down terrorism and insurgency. Uh, but often we see that that's not enough. Um, it might be simplistic to say that it's not enough, but the resilience of these groups very often can be traced to how effectively they rely on women. So even militarily, it's pretty crucial. Um, and then I guess last, um, you know, militant groups have really sophisticated, impressive gender strategies. I think often we, and by we, I mean military states, multilateral, multilateral organizations uh, are playing catch up with them. Um, often 
context to context, we see that they have more developed gender strategies than the militaries or the governments that are opposing them. They build gender uh, ideology and incentives into their recruitment, into their mobilization, into the service provision. So if they're doing gender really well, then we have to understand how and why and build doing gender very well as well into our responses. Um, and then, you know, lastly, I guess, um, if we're going to be looking at certain contexts where these groups are really kind of dominant political forces, like whole swaths of, of the Sahel region that Ella will talk about, you know, a, a significant portion of Somali territory, uh, they really are the dominant political forces. So actually, like looking at how women interact with them is pretty crucial to understanding the politics uh, of a place beyond the official politics of a government that holds only a small degree of control, as we've seen, you know, the implications of getting that somewhat wrong with Afghanistan. Um, so I think that's the kind of overall picture of why it's important to, to think about this. Excellent. Absolutely. I mean, women's support or, <clears throat> or involvement underpins a number of violent extremist groups, including you know, Boko Haram, Shabab, and others. Yet, for the most part, I mean, the assumptions you know, underpinning CVE, uh, counter violent extremism, tend to paint women as, as victims or, <clears throat> or peace builders and, and men as perpetrators, uh, but rarely victims of violence. So, so obviously, <clears throat> you know, there is a, a uh, a more complex reality on the ground, right? I mean, both men and, <clears throat> and women, as, as you stated, are involved in, in violent extremism. And this takes me to, um, to my second question. I mean, uh, uh, which, which relates to a particular context, which is Somalia. I mean, what is the role based on, on your studies and you know, research? What is the role that women play in, in Shabab, in Somalia? Um. So I've, I'll answer that by, by caveating what, what I'm to say, because of course I think the context is really important. Um, Shabab kind of entered and, and asserted, and I guess consolidated its control over large parts of the country um, in the context of years of war. So when I talk about the protection it might offer women, it's kind of in the, in the backdrop is the years of lawlessness sexual violence, kidnapping, you know, warlord warfare, clan warfare. Um, you know, if when I talk about women's choices or, or the roles that they play, it's important to realize that it's all on a sort of spectrum of coercion and agency, and it's quite um, complex. And of course, in many of the contexts that we're talking about, there's simply no judicial mechanisms, there's no state institutions, um, and women sort of seek out al-Shabaab, um, in order to often protect themselves to get some sort of um, judicial or, or some sort of punishment for rape or domestic violence. So all to say that, you know, there's a lot of ambivalence to these decisions and, you know, bearing in mind the context and the complexity of, of women's interaction with the group is really important. Um, so I'll just speak about um, a basket of roles. I mean, we did at crisis group, we did um, uh, a report, a briefing on women in al-Shabaab because we just felt it was really underexplored. The work on it was limited, and yet it seemed as though, you know, women were quite crucial to the group's um, successful operation, its ability to sort of sustain itself in the face of, um, you know, pretty escalating Amazon uh, and, and foreign troop efforts against it. So we did research and spoke to about I think 20 women fighters who had um, been in the group. And so what I'm saying is based on this field research. So sort of one basket of roles that, that we understood women to be playing was recruitment uh, and indoctrination or sort of uh, mobilization, I think, depending on, on how you view it, of course. Um, so Shabab runs administrative units in the provinces that it controls. And in those administrative units or wilayats as we're called, there's committees that are run by wives of senior officers um, and other women supporters who are just very committed. And they go door to door, they educate women, they propagandize, they organize lectures 
they hold discussions for women at religious centers um, and they encourage women who've married into the group to get active themselves. Sometimes they'll bring in a kind of more senior male figure to speak at these events to kind of boost their authority. Um, and I guess threaded into all of this is the idea that engaging with Shabab is in the service of Somalia. Of course, there's at the center of the group this tension between its transnational objectives, its national role. Uh, so I think this is all very much threaded into this kind of recruitment. Um, so divorce is, is a big problem in Shabab controlled areas and in Al Shabab communities. So women also act as, I guess we could say, informal marriage counselors trying to keep marriages stable. Of course, fighters are often away from home. Polygamy is pretty common. So there's, you know, often families where, um, you know, partners are just unhappy. So kind of keeping these families together is another role that women play. Um, and so sort of bringing more and more women into these circles. So recruitment is, is important. Um, fundraising as well. Uh, a Shabab has a developed taxation system. Um, you could call it a coercive or extortion based system, um, but women are often primary breadwinners in a lot of the areas that it controls. And so being able to use women's businesses for money laundering, smuggling, selling goods on their behalf um, is a way that it really relies uh, on women as well. Um, gathering intelligence and transporting weapons. Um, these are other things that women do um, in, in engagement with Shabab. They can carry explosive devices and components uh, in their clothes because for, for a long time they were not examined or not examined as thoroughly as men at checkpoints. Um, and then intelligence, I wouldn't, I would, I would sort of uh, underscore this as quite important. Um, we understood that Shabab uh, is quite focused on recruiting women from urban areas because they're seen as able to carry out more sophisticated intelligence gathering tasks. Um, for example, being willing to marry a foreign fighter to get better sense of what that foreign fighter is all about. Is he really committed? Uh, is he potentially working or reporting to another security agency? You know, that's the kind of task that a woman from an urban area is perhaps more willing or able to carry out than a woman from a rural area. Um, women run safe houses in, in major towns where Shabab has a presence, but it doesn't fully control the area. So these are kind of some of the range of intelligence and operational tasks. Um, and so this sort of as different baskets are, are what we understand are the, the active roles that women play. Um, I won't really go into combat because it doesn't seem that Shabam really um, is, is interested or believes in deploying women in the same way that Boko Haram has. Um, it's sort of Somali norms and the movement's own religious attitudes um, kind of prohibit against this. So the, the occasions where that's happened are rare. Um, so this is sort of the, I would say, the kind of spectrum of ways that women are, are actively involved. Right, fascinating. I mean, as you, you have uh, outlined, I mean, women play an, an active role in that, uh, that insurgency in, in Somalia and are involved in, in really critical activities uh, that contribute to the resilience uh, of, uh, of Shabab, as you said, they help recruit, fundraise, uh, proselytize, they gather intelligence that enable military operations uh, or extortion, they even ferry uh, <coughs> explosives ahead of, of, of attacks. And in a handful of cases, as you mentioned and, and, and you wrote in, in, in your report, they have even carried out strikes there themselves. Though the caveat is, as you pointed out, Shabab deploys um, uh, far. Uh, far fewer you know, suicide bombers than than, uh, than their Nigerian right uh, VE uh, group counterparts Boko Haram there. So, uh, but for the most part, from what you found in your in your research, is that women in Somalia do not participate directly in in military operations. Right, that's a, that's a fair uh, assessment. Okay, <laughs> or decision making, uh, and and that takes me to. Uh, um, to, uh, to another question is, you know, but why do some women uh, play an active part in Shabbat? Um, that's something that we deliberated a lot about as we were writing our report. Um, I think assessing why women would, uh, would 
would play such an active role is complicated. Um, some did say that they that they were or had been true believers, or that they still were. Um, others had more mixed feelings and motivations. Um, some wanted to avoid retribution. Some experienced um, pretty intensive family pressure to marry a Shabab fighter. Um, some were pretty explicit that they wanted to, or they saw marrying uh, a Shabab fighter, which is kind of the pathway to this involvement, um, as a way to advance socially. Um, you know, Shabab is really clever at navigating these uh, clan dynamics in Somalia, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So I suppose um, the reasoning, I, again, we have to sort of think about it on a spectrum of willingness, transactionalism, coercion, um, some residual feelings of perhaps nationalist or religious kind of uh, support or identification with the group swirling within these more prosaic daily security familial concerns. Um, one thing that we thought was interesting, um, and, and you just kind of pointed it out too as well, Anwar, uh, women who saw themselves uh, as really committed and fully involved um, would have said, yes, you know, I'm with Shabab, but Shabab itself, the fighters don't really include women as full members. So if you were to ask them, they would say, no, I mean, women uh, play a familiar role. They're not in our command structure. They're not in our decision-making bodies. Um, and at the same time, it seems like the Somali federal government doesn't really see women uh, as, as members. So um, in terms of kind of thinking about this, um, it was interesting to us that women themselves sort of seem to see their roles as more fully uh, meaningful than, than men did. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, the motivations, though, I mean, I think really it's important to stress marriage. Uh, marriage is a recruitment tool, as, as I was saying earlier, and it's just a way for, for women and men, really, if we're thinking about gender in this way, to advance their socio-political interests. Um, there was a fighter who uh, you know, a young man who had become a fighter who told us that before he joined Shabab, he was kind of poor and the girls in his local community used to call him names, they treated him with contempt. He joined Shabab, he cleaned up, he looked more affluent and suddenly he was a marriage magnet. Uh, so clearly, you know, to men and women both who are from minority clans, they can kind of seek political influence or economic gain, you know, families think, you know, the backdrop of this, of course, is pretty extreme poverty, um, that offering their daughters into Shabbat will get them some level of prestige and some economic protection as well. So uh, I think the, the sort of socioeconomic backdrop, the kind of limited other avenues, to some kind of political or social influence is, is really key to understanding why um, women and men, because I think, you know, it's hard to think of, of all of this uh, separately would, would drive them to affiliate. Um, I think also important to point out that widows, if they remarry within the group, retain their stipends. Um, I think we understood that if they were to remarry within the group, they would retain their widow stipend at a higher level uh, than they would if they married out. So there's kind of services or, or kind of social protection built in. So it's not that you know, you're abandoned once your husband or fighter husband dies, but you'll be taken care of and there's incentives built into that. So the whole kind of uh, protection or aspirational motivations kind of endure um, even, if, even if a woman's husband dies. Um, so I think the social backdrop um, is, is quite important. I mean, it seems to be one of the dominant themes. Um, and I think we're gonna, we'll talk about policy implications, um, but, but I think that's, to us, it seemed like the, the most important way of understanding why, apart from, of course, when it comes to financial and intelligence and these kind of other roles, I mean, if, if women are living in an area where Shabab is in control, they don't really have an option. If they're trading, if they run a tea stall, they have to pay tax. They have to maybe um, give information on who goes through their area of, of foreign forces. Otherwise, they'll have to pick up and leave. So, you know, that's, that's just a sort of survival aspect to it. Absolutely. Um... I mean, as you, you know, I mean, we have, we have to, to acknowledge, and, and you have done that obviously in, in your writings and, and you stated it as well, is that, you know, Shabab uh, uh, brutal uh, insurgency, uh, you know, has 
uh, has entailed considerable hardship for women, but but its rule, uh, you know, does bring benefits <clears throat> nonetheless. And, and we have to understand that prestige, the economic protection, as you said. And as you wrote in, in your in your report, you know, when whenever Shabab uh, controls, uh, you know, uh, where it controls territory, you know, it it can even offer women and, and girls a certain degree of <clears throat> of physical safety, especially in a country where there is, you know, uh, uh, where lawlessness is, 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 is widespread and where women are exposed to, uh, to sexual violence, uh, to kidnapping and to other kind of, of, of violence. So Shabab tackles this form of gender-based uh, gender uh, violence uh, by at times, right, even punishing, as you stated in your report, you know, they punish rapists, they intervene on behalf of women, right? Um, so, okay, and this, this takes us to the, you know, to the, uh, to the final question here uh, for you, uh, Azadi, before I, I move to, to Ella. Yeah, the policy implications. What are the policy implications of, of your research findings and the role of you? Um, so, so I'll, I'll mention a few um, quickly. I, I would caveat it with saying that you know, it, I think it's hard for the government uh, to win over women kind of outside of an approach that really ends the war because the population, of course, is incentivized to, to behave as it does because of this wider conflict. So, I mean, but, but so what I'm saying is, is a bit on the margins, but that said, I think there are some important things that can be done. Um, uh, I think the federal government can take some steps to show that it recognizes women's fears for their physical safety, um, that it wants to as well meet their needs. Um, you know, it's pretty astonishing that the parliament still hasn't passed a sexual offenses bill that would offer some greater basis for the prosecution of rapists and other offenders or those who commit sexual abuses. Um, you know, I think if as a woman, you can go to a Shabab court uh, and complain three times about domestic violence and get a response, it's pretty significant. If you can't do that through a government uh, justice mechanism, then, you know, in the end, if we're talking about protection in the way that we do, uh, you know, Shabab will have an answer to you. So unless the federal government um, can also offer an answer to these kind of needs, then um, essentially it needs a strategy to do that. And it needs to really have the political will to pursue that. Um, you know, security protocols. I mean, I think I mentioned all of the ways that women are, are kind of operationally really important to Shabab. Um, I think we do, of course, so it's inevitable then not to say that security forces should tighten their security protocols, that they should have more women included in their forces so that they can conduct screenings of women, but they so that they can do that without exposing women to uh, abuses from security forces. So kind of inclusion of women, better security protocols, but in a rights compliant way, because if it's not, it will just make everything much worse. Um, uh, and then maybe lastly, um, you know, CVE uh, and the kind of theory of change around CVE and women. Um, we did a lot of work on this and, and perhaps I'll drop the link uh, in the chat box. Um, the CVE programs that assume that ideology drives women to engage with Al-Shabaab um, end up being really ineffective, often exposing women who engage with these kind of programs um, uh, to, to risk. Um, because they're seen as cooperating with security forces and police forces, and they're seen as siding with one side of the conflict, and that makes women uh, targets, um, even though they're meant to be kind of part of the solution. Um, so I think understanding the role that women actually play, genuinely understanding what motivates them, how they might use Shabab to protect themselves, to access justice, um, this is really important to the kind of CVE programming that we get behind um, and kind of framing some of the work that women do. I mean, something that we heard a lot in the course of this research is that women's groups were trying to frame and pitch their work on things around water shortages, teenage pregnancy, gang violence. They were pitching this work as being linked to counterterrorism because that's how they thought they could get their funding. And they would say very openly, no, these things don't have anything in common. Um, 
I mean, unless you're going to sort of imagine that everything that could go wrong in a place or any kind of social economic challenge in a place will drive terrorism. Um, those that it's pretty urgent work that women can do well in their communities uh, that builds community resilience. It's maybe more traditional development work. Um, let's not package it as uh, CVE in order to fund it. Maybe that's what gets the funding, uh, but it often ends up putting those women uh, in the sights of militant groups who see them as then working with security forces. Oh, it's CVE. Oh, it's against Islam. Oh, they're working and reporting to the police. You know, that's not the way to um, best enable women uh, community builders, peace builders, activists who are making a difference on these issues. Um, by putting them in that basket. So I would just kind of end with that. Absolutely, and that reinforced, I mean, the, the importance of trying to understand, I mean, the, the gender dimensions of, of, of this problem, because that would allow for a better understanding, uh, 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 you know, of how to develop, uh, um, you know, well-suited, I mean, how to develop responses that are best suited to addressing the gender-based dynamics related to people joining, uh, you know, such groups. So uh, CVE approaches, they need to fully grasp uh, the role that, that women actually uh, play. Uh, so there is more that needs to be done to better understand the motivating factors, you know, why women support Shabab, uh, you know, efforts to understand women's need to access to access justice, uh, uh, women's need, uh, you know, for mechanisms uh, to that can adjudicate their complaints and and uh, and, and conflict. So, so thank you, uh, Azadeh. And now I will turn to um, uh, to to Ella, and I'll ask you, you know, uh, the same same question. I mean. In a, in a different context, obviously, in a Malian and, uh, and Nigerian context. I mean, how and why are women recruited in violent extremist groups in Mali and, uh, and in Niger? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anwar. Uh, maybe let me start uh, by greeting everyone, by greeting all the participants who took the time uh, to be here with us. Uh, but also sincerely thank the African Center uh, for Strategic Studies for the kind of invitation. Uh, in my remark, I will actually draw uh, from a recent uh, study that the ISS conducted on the reason why women join uh, groups such as Katiba Masina in Mali, especially Central Mali, uh, Boko Haram in the Dispa region uh, in, in, in Niger. Um, and the reason why it was important for us to, to work on that, and I think Azadeh already talked about this, is because we actually noticed that often uh, women are just forgotten uh, in our understanding, but also in, in policy recommendation. So for us, it was important to go beyond perception study, to go beyond what we think we know uh, might be pushing women to join those groups, but also why women don't join those groups. I think that's important because some study have been done on why people join, why women, men join those groups. But I think it's equally important to also understand why people, including women, living in contexts where these groups are present, why don't they join this group? I think it can already give uh, some uh, actionable tools uh, that government can uh, reinforce at the, at the local level. Uh, that being said, now to come back to your, to your question, uh, the research that has been conducted uh, by the ISIS reveal three main pathway of women into, into, this, uh, into this group. Um, we documented cases where women joined this group or decided to collaborate with, with this group uh, through their own choice. Uh, on their own accord. And I think this is important because often uh, there's a tendency to see women as passive, as passive victims of violent extremism. Uh, this research showed that women also shows agency in their decision to join violent extremist group. We also documented cases where uh, women were recruited under duress. Uh, they were kidnapped or they were forced to join this group either by the family member but also by, by, by the group. Uh, and a last a pathway that we documented are cases where women actually uh, provided services 
to people without knowing that these people have a link uh, with either Katiba Marcina or Boko Haram in Niger, or without knowing what the service will be used for. Uh, so these are the, the, the three pathways that we documented. Now, beyond this pathway that we documented, uh, the research highlighted uh, important uh, and often interrelated. Yeah, so beyond those pathways that, that I just talked about, we also documented a variety of reasons, right, that make women join this group. And some of them are similar to what uh, Azade have already talked about in a different context, in the context of, of Somalia. Uh, the first uh, reason that we documented uh, that made women uh, associate with, with this group in either uh, Mali or Niger, uh, was family and marital link. If I take the example of, of Niger, we documented cases where women uh, joined this group to find a husband, the same way men join uh, often this group to find a wife, uh, right? We documented cases where uh, women or girls decided to follow their husband, follow their boyfriend or relative that joined this group. Now, going back to the case of, of Mali, uh, women often associate or collaborate with Katiba Masina through a male uh, member that is uh, part of the group, through a male relative that is uh, part of Katiba uh, Masina. And we also documented cases where parents decided to marry off uh, their daughter to the group, either uh, with Willingly, but also under duress as a way to contribute, contribution, especially a parent who was sympathizer of the group, decided to marry off their daughter as a contribution to the group, but also as a way to protect themselves, right, in an environment where either the state is not present or the state is contested. Uh, now coming back to the to the second uh, motivation that we documented, and this is linked to something that Azadeh already said, uh, is the need of women to protect themselves. Right, to protect themselves in contexts uh, where uh, you have ongoing uh, insecurity, you have ongoing violence, both from this group, but also other actors uh, of insecurity. Uh, if you take the case of, of, of Mali, Katiba Masina, some women revealed that they decided to collaborate uh, with the group to actually guarantee peaceful coexistence uh, with, the, with the group in a space where the state is not present to protect them, uh, to guarantee their own safety, but also to guarantee the safety of the family members. Um, Others join the group to protect their income generating uh, activities that I can give uh, example later on. In the case of Boko Haram regarding protection logic, it was mainly uh, the case of women who were kidnapped or women who were instructed uh, by the group to join them or either uh, risk losing their, 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 their life or uh, seeing one of the family member being killed. Another motivation that we documented uh, is linked to the fact that some women decided to collaborate uh, with this group as a way to seek revenge, right? To seek revenge uh, in contexts where they perceive a violation uh, against a loved one during counterterrorism operation, and this calling to question uh, the way uh, counterterrorism operations are conducted and what type of uh, security uh, oversight or what type of oversight uh, are, are put in place to uh, limit uh, violation or even perception of, of violation of human rights that can actually push uh, some women to decide to provide information on the whereabouts of security forces uh, to this group as a way for them to actually uh, seek revenge for uh, a, a family member uh, killed by, uh, by security forces. And the last motivation that I want to, to highlight uh, is linked to religious motivation. Um, in the case of, and this has mainly been documented uh, in Niger where women joined the, the group to learn the Quran. So this has a religious uh, motivation, but also an education uh, motivation, right? The, the, the need to have access to religious ed education, but also to wage uh, jihad uh, in some of the cases that we look at. Uh, thank you, Ella. And again, you, you, you demonstrate how the, you know, the <clears throat> engagement or the term you use uh, in your report um, is the association of, of women with uh, Katiba and Messina in Mali or Boko Haram in Niger, uh, you know, uh, stems from diverse but often interconnected circumstances and 
and and and, and reasons uh, again i mean the need to protect themselves uh, some to look for revenge uh, 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 there were other reasons that, that you stated and that was documented, whether it's marital family ties with uh, women belonging to, uh, to these groups. Uh, so the association and the various roles they, they play within the groups, whether uh, forced under duress or, you know, voluntarily, it provides, uh, uh, you know, an advantage to these violent groups, or as you put it, you know, it provides uh, strategic but also operational <clears throat> advantages and this will take me to the second question uh, but before I, I i do just for our participants if you can you know submit your questions into the chat you can, you can do that at any time right uh during the as as, as we continue and as i said earlier we'll keep track of them and, and try to answer during the the, the q a <clears throat> so for the second question then what is the what is their place I mean, women here, what is their place and role in the recruitment and operation strategies of these violent extremist groups? Uh, thank you, Anwar. And, and I think that that brings me uh, back to what you already mentioned in your, in your remark, the fact that often uh, even this decision makers and even in policy document, you often see that they downplay uh, the, the importance of women uh, in context of violent extremism, but also in context uh, for violent extremist group. And what the research reveal is that women are actually strategic human resources to this group. Even in areas such as the Sahel where they are invisible, uh, this group are already uh, using the, these women uh, to gain not only strategic advantages, but also operational uh, advantages. As part of the research that we conducted, and I can share the, the link with participants if they haven't uh, received it, we documented uh, 13 roles that women play for this group. Uh, we documented support role that women play for this, for this group as informant, uh, as recruiter, not only recruiter of men, but also recruiter of women. Uh, this group, they help this, uh, this women help uh, group uh, during the procurement, uh, they help them uh, get supplies, whether medicine, food stuff, but also uh, material for the for the operation, and they help this group also raise fund. And and as I talked about this, women also play domestic and reproductive role, right? Uh, they are wife, they are cook, they are mothers, they are cleaners. They also take care of uh, those who are wounded uh, during during combat. And importantly, both in Mali and Niger. We, 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 we found out that women also play operational role for this group. They are used as scouts, for example, uh, before uh, this group conducts the operation. And specifically in the case of Niger, we documented cases where women are deployed as suicide bomber, whether voluntarily or uh, under, under duress. Uh, and the group used them for various reasons. Uh, and this reason, from, from what we have seen in, in the data of the research, is that this reason evolved according to the group need, their strategy, and the context in which they develop, they, they, they evolve. So it's important to take this into consideration in the way policies are developed to counter and prevent violent extremism. As policies have been implemented, group often adapt the strategy and the strategy also evolves. So we need to take this into consideration when crafting a policy to prevent and counter uh, violent extremism. So why is it important? Why do this group include women, right? First of all, we realize that they include, they include women uh, to grow their number because women themselves, they are men, by joining the group, whether they, they do it uh, by choice or they are forced to do so, uh, they help grow the number of this group, but they also help recruit for this group, right? They help recruit for this group in their family, but also uh, in the community. They often use as bait, right? To lure uh, men who are looking for wives. And this is the case, this has uh, been used uh, by uh, Boko Haram, especially under, under Shekau. Uh, they also play a reproductive role. And this is very important because this role that women play help uh, they sustain the, the, the group in the long run. Um, another, another way or another, another uh, use of, of, of women uh, for this group is that they, they also uh, help uh, this group sustain their daily life. 
uh, by playing a domestic role or what we call traditional role in, in, in our society, such as uh, housework, cooking, uh, wash, washing, and, and, and others. Uh, the third uh, motivation for this group uh, for including women that we documented uh, is the fact that by marrying women in areas where uh, they operate, uh, groups are seeking to implant themselves, not only to implant themselves, but also to secure uh, the support, whether active or, or, or passive, of, of a population in the areas where they, they operate, because often they rely on those populations to provide them uh, with services or to provide them with information vital uh, for, for, their, for their region. Women also enable this group to obtain logistic and finance. And, and as I did already talk about uh, some of this, uh, they help them source supply, uh, whether food, uh, medicine, material uh, for the operation. And one, uh, one of such uh, material that we actually discovered for the research is fertilizer that is used in this group uh, to produce and uh, improvise uh, explosive uh, device. But women, especially kidnapped uh, women, both in the context of Niger, but also Mali, uh, help this group raise funding through the demand of ransom, or also uh, sometimes negotiate uh, the liberation of the member arrested uh, by security uh, forces. And the last point that I wanted, I want to, to mention is all the operational advantages that this group gain by including women, including women as invisible uh, actors in the operation, but also including women as visible as the case of women suicide bomber that we have seen uh, in, in the case of uh, Niger with Kukwara. Fascinating, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and, and again, I, it's interesting how you show that the operational level, how they, like what Azeri pointed out in the context of, of Somalia, even if it's different, but how they contribute to the group's you know, intelligence network and how they uh, support the recruitment efforts, how they facilitate their establishments within the communities, you know, how they contribute, as you, as you stated, and you wrote in your report, to ensure uh, the group's logistical supply chains you know, in terms of combat materials, uh, food stuff, uh, uh, you know, uh, et cetera. So that, uh, that takes me to the uh, third and, and final question, which is uh, like the one that I asked uh, as I did before, is the policy implications. What are the policy implications of, of this research findings, especially that Mali is <clears throat> currently uh, preparing to revise its PCVE national, um, you know, policy, and Niger has has already finalized, you know, my understanding, its own national strategy. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Anwar. Uh, what I actually noticed by analyzing those two documents uh, is the fact that in those documents, either women are portrayed as victim or they are portrayed as peace builder. Uh, right, uh, and there is an overemphasis on women' maternal attributes. Uh, since they are sisters, they are mothers, then they should prevent their relative from joining those groups. Uh, but, however, what uh, while that that understanding or that awareness of the impact of violent extremism on on women, uh, but also on the positive role that they can play as as peace builder and that they are already playing in, in community is important, it is problematic for a number of reasons, and I will just highlight a few of them before getting to the, to the policy implication. First of all, is a partial understanding of women's experiences. Women are not only victims, uh, they are not only peace builders, they also show agency uh, in a uh, context of violent extremism. Uh, this understanding of women's uh, role is also problematic because it often reinforces gender stereotype, right? Uh, that often sees male as violent and women as incapable of, 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 of engaging in any, anything that is, that is violent. And they, they tend to confine women uh, in, uh, even when they, they, they talk about the positive role that women can play. This is really confined to the domestic area. So the positive role that women can play as peace builder, they should play it at the domestic level, right? They should play it in the home level, not uh, beyond that level. And we know that women are already playing roles that go beyond uh, what they are doing at the domestic level. So that being said, 
what they need to be taken into consideration as uh, these two countries move to implement uh, their, their strategy as the case of Niger or revise uh, their, their PCV uh, strategy. And for the sake of time, I will just highlight four of them, and one of it has already been straightened since the beginning of the webinar, right? I think it is important that we acknowledge and take into consideration gender in all policies uh, that are developed in all initiatives uh, developed to counter and prevent violent extremism, even in contexts such as Mali, where women are seen as invisible. It's not because they are invisible that they are not important for this group, that they are not playing roles. So we need to keep this, uh, this in mind. Uh, second, it is important that we move beyond simplistic understanding of women experiences in context of violent extremism as either victim or peace builder, right? Or as, as actor of violent extremism. And we should really take, take into consideration the diversity of experiences of women in context of violent extremism. Uh, in the case of the research that I, I, I spoke about at the beginning, uh, we found out that women are victim of this group, right? Some of them join this group. Some of them, after joining this group, decide to leave them. And others, while not being member of this group, encourage their, their, their relative to either join, leave this group, or not join this group. So I think it's important that we take into consideration this diversity of experiences of women, but and that we don't limit them uh, to either being victim, peace builder, or, or actor of, of violent extremism. We should also be mindful that these experiences are interconnected, right? Uh, the woman victim, for example, uh, can become an actor uh, of this violent extremism, can leave this group, and then encourage uh, other people not to, to get involved in this group. So it's very important that we move beyond siloed understanding, which can be counterproductive uh, in the way we deal with, with women uh, in context of violent extremism. And we must also take into consideration both the visible, but also the invisible role that women play for this group. Uh, the reason why they don't uh, join this group, the advantages that this group gain by including women by, or by excluding women, but also the advantages that women gain uh, by joining uh, uh, this group. The second policy, the third policy implication that I want to, to highlight uh, is the importance that solution develop, right? Any initiative, any policy develop must be uh, inclusive. Uh, on the one hand, if women join this group, but also leave this group, it's important that an initiative uh, put in place to encourage people to leave this group, but also to reintegrate uh, this group defect into community that we include women, but that we also tailor uh, these policies to women, uh, to women men. This is important not only to encourage women to leave the group, but also it can be in the long run an effective strategy to weaken the group by depriving them of the human resources. It is also important, and we can come back to, to this, it's also important to avoid that women who leave this group, or even men who leave this group, uh, decide because of unmet expectation once they are out of this group, that they decide to go back into, into those groups. And on the, other, uh, on the other hand, it's important that policy develop are inclusive uh, because while we can reinforce women resilience, right? And ensure that they don't find themselves in those groups because of the important uh, role played by family and marital link uh, in pushing women into this group or pushing them out of this group. Solution that we develop to prevent women association with this group must also include men. Uh, if not, we will reinforce uh, women resilience, but then uh, the, the, as soon as the family member, the male family member decide to join a group, then they will be able to drag them uh, into, into those groups. And, and last and but not least, I want to highlight the importance of research, right? We need to continue generating research on uh, the reason why women join this group, the reason why they don't join this group, uh, but also the, the, the reason why this group includes them and, and vice versa. So, uh, they are important not only because I'm a, 
I'm a researcher and I'm talking about research, but they are important uh, because they can help us inform policies and practices and make sure that they are evidence-based. They are based on the reality of those women we don't often see in capital cities, those women that are living in areas where this group are present and that, are, that have their own life history, that have their own experiences that must be taken into consideration uh, when we draft a policy. Uh, and lastly, it is important uh, because it helps us uh, ensure that women need are taken into consideration and that women are also included as a stakeholder in their own in their in their own right. If this group already see a use uh, for including women, they see women as important. I think government should also do the same. See women as important and associate them beyond the domestic. Uh, level, associate them in everything that is done uh, to prevent and counter violence. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ella. Uh, and this, you know, brings us to the, you know, uh, Q&A. Uh, and just to, to sum up again, what we have heard <clears throat> from our two distinguished uh, uh, panels is, is how it is critical to understand you know, the reasons for women's involvement and engagement. We have to understand the strategic objectives that each of these violent extremist groups seek to achieve by involving women in their activities. And then we have to understand what Ella said, the different visible and invisible roles that they assign to women. So again, gender awareness in, in, in CVE, you know, requires uh, a grasp and understanding of the different roles women play in preventing, empowering, supporting <coughs> violent uh, extremism, as well as their experiences as victims as well. Um, so we have, it requires an understanding of how, you know, CVE strategies, uh, uh, as, 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 as it is pointed out, how CVE policies and programs may impact you know, women and women groups, uh, and sometimes adversely. Uh, so now let's go to the uh, Q and A. And again, please, you can submit questions uh, into into the chat. So bear with me for one <coughs> second. All right, well, we have some questions here, and the first question is for both Azade and Ella. And is as follows, why do you think society has a difficult time seeing women as victims and not as aggressors, uh, violent offenders? So that's a first question. Second question is, which you already addressed to be fair, is the role of women in, 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 in terrorist groups. Are they involved in recruitment or are they used as support facilitators? Obviously I've, I've addressed that. And this question is for Ella. Um, talking about the way women were treated in, in Boko Haram. I mean, do you make the difference between the treatment of women by Boko Haram and treatment by the so-called Islamic State in West Africa? Since, uh, since there is obviously a difference uh, between them. Uh, and and, and uh, fourth question, and, and I'll stop here, and this was for, for Azari, but I think for all, it's about ethnic identity and how it interacts with gender. And uh, one of the participants who give the example of an Acholi woman might have felt more secure with Joseph Conan than with the government of, uh, of Mussolini. I mean, since the war was perceived as, as an identity uh, 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 conflict. So, so yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll turn it to you, you know, if you can just uh, respond briefly and then we will have uh, another an, uh, uh, another round of questions. So, um, Azadi, you want to? Azadi, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I'll go really quickly. Um, on the question about why does society um, struggle to see these women as victims versus violent aggressors? Uh, that's a really interesting one. Um, I mean, I think the the kind of societal attitude that's essentially quite in line with majority, I think, um, still kind of subscribing to quite patriarchal attitudes towards women. I mean, I would say in our research, especially in Northeast Nigeria, the dominant view was that women were really victims. Um, they were still highly stigmatized when they came out of a group like Boko Haram. Uh, but 
over time, believing that they had been victims, that they had been brainwashed, that they hadn't, um, you know, maybe they were tainted in terms of kind of shame honor attitudes by having been with the group, but that they were just women, um, I think helped women kind of counterintuitively reintegrate because they were not seen as as dangerous as men. So I think cultural, social patriarchy on the other side of the experience actually plays to the advantage of women who have come out of these groups and don't want to go back and are trying to reintegrate. So I think kind of patriarchal attitudes are at the core of whether women are seen as actors or not. And on the other side, uh, it can be to women's advantage. Um, on the question, of tribal ethnic identity. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think women have intersecting identities and at times uh, their clan, their religious, their sectarian, their ethnic identity may come to the fore. They may identify more with their minority clan or with their, or with their ethnic and tribal identity than they do as women. I mean, I think uh, the, the women in Syria, for example, who uh, affiliated with ISIS, also in Iraq, were clearly more impacted as Sunni Iraqis or as Sunni Syrians than they were as women Syrians or women Iraqis. But these things are fluid because if you go through a group like that, they make you marry three times every time your husband dies. And at the end of it, you have six children from three different men. You're just a really beaten down woman. And maybe you don't wanna have anything to do with that group anymore. So you go through a journey where one element of your identity drives your interaction with the group. And then maybe it stops doing that through what happened to you. Um, so I'll stop there. I think uh, I really want to hear what Ella thinks about uh, women in uh, treatment at the hands of Boko Haram versus Iswa, because I think that's really interesting. Absolutely. Hello. No, thank you. Thank you. And on the on the first question, I completely agree with what you already said, uh, social norms, stereotype, and also patriarchy that uh, make it uh, both uh, at community level, but also uh, what in what you see in policy document, uh, this view that women can only be victim, right? And this can be both both positive, like uh, Azade uh, highlighted, because in some community, if I take the example of Niger, uh, which has an ongoing uh, DDR program in the Gudumaria camp, right? It was easier for some community member to accept women because they are seen as victims. Uh, they were victims, they were kidnapped, so we can accept them. However, it can have a negative impact where women are seen as beyond victim, right? When women are seen as deviating from the social norm, uh, women are not supposed to get in, engaged in violence. So the one who get in, engaged in violence, then we cannot accept them uh, in, back into our society because they are seen as people who deviated from the social norm. So I think it can both have a positive impact, but also uh, a negative uh, impact. And there's a need, and I think that starts from us knowing more uh, about why, why women join this group, but also keep on raising awareness, right? Keep on raising awareness on the importance for us to move beyond this limited uh, understanding because while we are, we are limiting our understanding of women, if we see them only as victim, the solution that we will develop will deal with them as victim. Uh, and what we will do is that we will overlook all those women who join this group for other reason, who show agency and once they come out of the group, they don't have alternative. So the only alternative might be to go back to the group and this creates a virtuous uh, cycle. And I see as that they uh, agree with me on this. What are the women role in terrorism? We already talked about some of them, but if you think it's important, we can come back uh, and highlight some of them. Uh, the way women are treated in, in Boko Haram, so Boko Haram Jazz that was uh, led by uh, by Shekau and then Boko Haram Iswap. And maybe before I answer, I should say that since the death, the announced death of, of Shekau, there's actually a blurring of line, right? Between uh, those who were part of, of Shekau group and those who are now part of Iswap and some of them going back and forth between the two groups or using the opportunity of uh, uh, the death of Shekau to actually uh, exit, exit the, the group. What we have seen in, in, in terms of difference, uh, right, is, is mainly in the way ISWAP um, goes around the idea of deploying women, Muslim women, uh, as suicide bombers. And this was one of the points uh, that led to the split between uh, Shekau and uh, Iswa back in August 2016. It's really this idea that uh, Muslim women should not be deployed uh, as 
uh, a suicide uh, bomber. But then it's important to highlight that this might change, uh, right? In areas controlled by ISWAP, uh, we have documented cases of suicide bombing, but ISWAP itself of women suicide bombing, but ISWAP itself has not come out to actually uh, recognize any of this, right? This might be a strategy, but this might also show that depending on need, the, the position of ISWAP on uh, who they deploy, women, Muslim women, or women who are considered as, uh, 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 as, as haram, that they decide to, 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 to deploy might also change. So I think we need to take uh, this into, into consideration as uh, the context in which ISWAP operate changes, the context uh, and also the need and the strategy uh, also uh, change and maybe uh, Azade might want to address uh, what uh, she has seen in the context of uh, the Middle East regarding how uh, Islamic State uh, deal with this issue of deployment of women suicide. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, I have other questions here, some in, in French. Um, I'll try to uh, translate those. So one question is they're asking, do we know how many women are in, in these groups? I mean, the percentage of women in these groups, are there many? Is the number increasing, decreasing? Uh, and a second question deals with, uh, uh, with gender-based violence. Does gender-based violence, this is in French, promote violent extremism? I mean, what is the impact of gender-based violence in you know, establishing violent extremism. What is the direct link between violent extremism and, and gender-based violence? Uh, other questions, this one is for Ella. I mean, does your data show <clears throat> that, and also frankly for, for Azari, does your data show that radicalization and extremism among women is increasing or, or decreasing? Uh, you know, uh, what responsive mechanisms uh, or mechanism has or can be put in place to create, you know, the, uh, to create awareness and what is the role of uh, civil society organizations? Can we cite examples, some success stories uh, uh, out there? And the final question, considering the discussion so far, so they're asking about the conflict in, in Ethiopia I and mean, how do you characterize the women in Tigray Ethiopia who are taking arms to fight for self-defense um, after, a, you know, what the participant characterizes a cruel mass raping, killing the women and children by their own military, which was expected to protect them. Do we characterize them as violent extremists? And what are the parameters to define violent extremism and, and defense for survival in a situation of ethnic rape? Yeah, so, uh, you know, a uh, lot of questions in there. So please pick uh, the ones that uh, that are uh, that apply uh, to you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Ella. Great, uh, thank you, thank you for the for the question. Uh, maybe on the number, uh, it is actually difficult uh, to have uh, to, to to talk about a specific number of women in this group and even broadly of membership. Right, there's always a debate about how many. The group often tend to inflate the number of, of combatants they have, of the number of members they have, and state often uh, try to downplay the, the, the number of people uh, that, that this group uh, have. And for us, it is actually important to go beyond numbers, right? To really focus on the life story of those people who joined those, those groups. We can talk to, to 20 people, uh, right, that live in context of violent extremism, but never get to understand what is happening. But then we can talk to two people uh, who have been commander or who have joined those groups and then be able to have a better understanding of what's happening there. So I think beyond number is an important question uh, and that should also be taken into consideration. But also beyond number, I think it's important to also uh, look at the life story uh, of those people who actually joined those, those groups. Uh, does gender-based violence promote uh, violent extremism? Uh, I will say yes. All type of frustration, actually, and in the case of the, the both the Sahel region uh, and also the Lake Chad uh, basin, you see that often this group they instrumentalize and they also use frustration, existing frustration at the local level. I think this is important because often you see solution that are that are so disconnected from the local level. Meanwhile, the group they are relying 
on local grievances, violent, uh, gender-based violence included to recruit uh, women or other reason to, to, recruit, uh, to recruit them. So I think all type of frustration that are not dealt with, uh, all type of issue grievances, vulnerability at local level that are not dealt with can be instrumentalized by this group to, to, to recruit. Is radicalization among women increasing or decreasing? Um, I think maybe before I answer that, let me question the, 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 the concept of radicalization, right? Um, in most of the study that we conducted, we found out that even men and, and, and women, while some get engaged for religious uh, reason, most of them don't get in, involved for religious reasons. So they haven't gone through that process of radicalization that make them join the group, right? But this doesn't mean that once in the group, they are not radicalized. We've seen cases where once in the group, this group actually have a strategy uh, to uh, brainwash people into uh, getting uh, convinced and uh, buying into what, what they're doing. So is it increasing or decreasing? I cannot, I, I don't have the answer. Uh, to that question, uh, but I think it is it, it, it is important. And in terms of the mechanism that can be used to raise uh, awareness, I agree with you, civil society has a role to play, but civil society can play that role only if civil society better understand, right? If civil society base uh, whatever initiative, awareness raising initiative that they are conducting on evidence so that whatever they are doing is not counter counterproductive. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Uh, I'm going to address the question on the role for civil society and success stories, because um, that, that might be uh, <laughs> nice to do as well. Um, and then I'm afraid I'm going to have to jump off because I have a class waiting for me to go teach. Um, I think it's really quite important for civil society uh, and governments who are in a, in, a, in a place to be able to interact with international donors that deal with civil society to really emphasize the need for locally owned and driven programming around these policies. Um, I will give an example. In Somalia, there was a very extensive uh, project that was uh, driven by both international donors and civil society. I talked a lot about how the absence of a justice system, a court system, drives women to interact with Al-Shabaab. Uh, this programming kind of came in and it was trying to recruit village elders, community elders, traditional elders to play an informal um, role in kind of informal justice mechanisms. Because the idea was that women need solutions to their divorce, to their domestic violence challenges. Uh, there's no courts other than Shabab. Let's get the community elders to come in and play this role of a kind of de facto court system. That was externally created, uh, and it ended up not really addressing women's objectives and their needs most effectively. You know, traditional elders are not courts. They may not be progressive. They may not be fair-minded. They may reproduce a quite patriarchal outcome. You know, if the theory of change is, you know, let's give women some legal mechanisms for dealing with situations that are violent, um, maybe if they were, maybe, and, and there were sort of civil society women who were observing this program, who did research on its outcomes, they thought paralegals, supporting women to be able to work with paralegals or other ways to take their cases forward would locally meet their objectives better. So I just think that coming back to civil society women and letting the community, women in a given community, generate the programming and to run it. In, uh, in Northeast Nigeria, we uh, were looking at a demobilization program for women uh, that was not run by women from Borno State. It was run by women from Abuja who were bringing in religious leaders who were not from that area. And it ended up having a really high rate of recidivism. So I think from a policy perspective, ensuring that that these ideas and programming have a really locally grounded uh, theory of change and implementation is quite important. So uh, that's that's my thought. Thank you. I mean, uh, what a nice way to uh, to, to end uh, our our webinar. Uh, and I, uh, you know, can't thank you enough, uh, uh, and the participants, if you see in the chat uh, as well. So they they extend their, their congratulations and. Uh, 
for a well done, well done job. So, uh, and I apologize for our participants, as you see again in the chat, there are still many, many questions uh, uh, out there, but this is not the end of, uh, of this discussion. So we will continue, uh, we will continue this. So uh, thank you, uh, Azini and, uh, and Ella. Uh, and before I, I close, just overall what, what, what we got quickly is that what, what seems so important is to recognize, as, as Azari and Ella as well stated, is that the violent extremist groups, notwithstanding their ideology, notwithstanding their doctrine, they do have a gender strategy, right, of, you know, to engage women and in some cases to meet their needs. So any strategy, any policy, any program that lack a gender-based analysis will fail. You know, it will fail to see the gender differences in the drivers of violent extremism. Uh, so we need this gender analysis. It gives us a comprehensive assessment in a given context, obviously, of the differences between men and, and women regarding opportunities, the constraints, uh, the distribution of power structures, etc. So we need more work like what uh, Azadi has done, like what Ella has done to perform this gender analysis of the drivers of violent extremism, as well as the differentiated roles of uh, both men and women play in society, so that we have a better understanding of the motivations that drive both men and women to join these uh, violent extremist groups. Uh, so, so thank you again, uh, Azari and, and Eli. It was a, a, a pleasure and a privilege uh, to have you to have you with us uh, today. So, thank you. Good luck to you, and uh, stay safe and, and well to you and all our participants. Thank you very much.